So hey team, uh, as MJ said, we just got fresh out of this uh, Cloudera certification class. So we're trying to impart as much knowledge as we can in a 10 minute span uh, about Hadoop and uh, how, it, how, it solves, how it solves our lives. And going off our solution, all, all of our lives. So going off that solution uh, kind of idea, something that I, going into this class, I was kind of confused about is what is this term big data? What, what does it mean? Is it just kind of this ball of data sitting somewhere on the cloud? Somewhere, I don't know, what is it? And I think you have to figure out what big data is and what that problem is we need to solve before you can introduce Hadoop and find out how does this solve uh, big data. So the, the problems that are, that are involved with big data boil down to three simple words. And they're the volume, which corresponds to the amount of data we have in backlog and we're drowning in that amount of data and how do we process it? How do we correlate different values, and how do we correlate that to information that our, um, our customer wants to see? The second word is velocity, and that corresponds to the current speed at which we're receiving new data, and that's adding onto our backlog, and we're further drowning, and we need to process that data as it comes in instead of adding into our backlog so we can make those correlations on the fly. And the last one is variety, and that as you can imagine, corresponds to the ETL phase of Hadoop and the ETL phase of big data. And we're getting, we're getting values of data in text form. We're getting values in geospatial coordinates, numbers. How do we correlate all those different values and bring them together into information that our users need? And so that being said, Hadoop solves, solves our problem in this, in this aspect. And what's, what's the solution to big data? What, what's that, how does Hadoop solve it? And Grace Hopper, the lovely Grace Hopper, if you do not know who she is, she's a, she was a rear admiral in the US Navy, retired obviously now, but she is heralded as one of the mothers of computer science. She wrote the first compiler in COBOL, so it's a, it's a little before my time, but uh, so I don't know if people wrote a COBOL in this room, but I'm sure some, somebody did. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Kyle, would you mind reading this quote for me from Grace Hopper? Uh, in pioneer days, they used oxen for heavy pulling, and when one oxen couldn't budge a log, they didn't try to grow a larger ox. We shouldn't be trying for bigger computers, but for more systems of computers. Exactly. And that's what, that's what Hadoop tries to leverage when solving this big data problem. She, she thought of it way before a time, way before Hadoop was, was established, but that's the exact same mentality we kind of take into this. And that being said, I'm going to pass it off to Dave here, who's going to talk to you about how Hadoop actually uses this, these ideas to solve our problem. So prior to me taking the training course, uh, I saw a scary graphic, this one here. <laughs> and I saw all these boxes, and I let those boxes throw me a curveball into thinking that Hadoop was far more complicated than it actually is. Uh, the, the two, there's really two core components to Hadoop. It's HDFS and MapReduce. And those are what we're going to talk about today. So I just want to make sure that y'all don't suffer the same problem I had. And don't let the bottom half of that screen really throw you off when you're trying to conceptualize Hadoop. Um, all of those ecosystem components really exist to facilitate the, the core components, which we're going to talk about. For those of you that must know or have some insight into them, um, Scoop and, and Flume really just import data into HDFS. Um, Pig and Hive uh, allow non-Java developers to be more productive. Um, Uzi can, is kind of a workflow utility. There's others. But all of them really just facilitate the top two things. So we're going to talk about the core components. And we'll start with the HDFS. So what is HDFS? Well, it stands for Hadoop Distributed File System. It's based on Google File System. It's written in Java. And it's designed to run on a cluster of commodity servers. And there's several ways you can interface with it. Uh, there's a command line. Uh, there's a Java API. Um, the ecosystem components right to it. And, and there's a, a graphical component as well. Um, so what's special about this? Um, distributed computing's been around for a long time. And for a long time, distributed computing has been complex to work with programmatically, specifically when dealing with uh, partial results. So what HDFS allows and Hadoop allows you to do is you focus on your core business logic and it will handle the, the, the plumbing and the complexity having to distribute it. 
Um, we'll talk about some details on that in, in a moment. So, so I'm going to back uh, digress just a moment. Um, in this room, I'm sure there are some people that have heard of Moore's Law. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Okay. There's a lesson. Well, um, for those who don't know, would anybody like to share it? Mm -hmm. Now transistors double each year. Yes. And the implication is that our, we can expect our processing power to roughly double along with that every 18 to 24 months. So there's a lesser known law that, that speaks to disk storage. Um, has anyone heard of Kreider's law? Okay, I didn't know about it either. <laughs> but um, it, 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 it has to do with uh, the density on magnetic disks. And it implies that we can expect that our storage capacity on a disk will roughly double every 13 months quicker than process, processing speed. But there's, there's something very interesting about that. So as our disks have grown, in 1990, a standard disk size would be about 1,500 megabytes. In 2010, that's about, it's a terabyte now. And in 1990, we could read that full 1,500 meg in about five minutes. In 2010, if we want to read the full disk, two and a half hours. So even though our, our, our disk size has increased, our capacity to read it quickly hasn't, hasn't, hasn't um, accelerated at the, same, at the same rate. So how does Hadoop tackle this? Well, in a word, it's, it's parallelism. Uh, or as Grace would say, we bring more, more oxen um, to move the log. So we'll talk about how it accomplishes that. So, over there, the orange block, we have a large data file that's going to go into HDFS. HDFS is going to split that into blocks. So if this d data file was twice the size it is, we'd have four blocks. It's going to split it for us. Um, it will replicate that to multiple nodes in the cluster. So you can see block one being transferred over. See block two being transferred over. So ultimately, what we end up with is the blocks that are being stored in multiple nodes. And this will allow multiple machines to process that same file when we need to. So what else does this give us? Well, if, if we lose any of these nodes, HDFS keeps track of where the files exist, what blocks are stored on which nodes. And if we lose a node, it'll give us it, we already have the redundancy, and it will replicate for us the nodes that it no longer has to, uh, from, from existing uh, copies that it has. Additionally, if we're running a job and that job fails, it gives us fault tolerance. HDFS will recognize that, that the job failed and will reassign that task to another node in the cluster that has the data that it needs. So that's big. And you know, traditionally, data has been stored in a central location, and when we want to process it, the data gets transferred from, from the central data store to where the processor exists. And that model only scales so far. At some point, you have more data than is practical to move. And so HD, uh, Hadoop kind of flips this on its head, and instead of bringing the data to the processor, it brings the algorithm to where the data lives. And Tony's going to talk about how that happens. All right. So what Dave was just talking about was our, what's our paradigm of how we process our data where it lives. What, is that, what does that look like? And that actually is the MapReduce paradigm, as you can see here on the board. And the three main core ideas of the MapReduce paradigm are data locality, and that's what Dave touched on, processing that data where it lived so we can leverage the the disk transfer time, where instead of sending our data across the network, we already have it there locally on that node. The next two are parallelism and block independence, and they're kind of co-related. The block independence allows us to say that this specific node is only going to be operating on this data or this block of data. It has, as Dave touched on earlier, through we're separating our blocks across our cluster, we want to just operate on that data, that data itself. And that allows us to not have to wait on the processing of other data on other nodes. And so we, then we don't have bottlenecks, and then we can provide parallelism to across our cluster. MapReduce, as you may know, <laughs> happens in three stages. But the main two stages are map and reduce. The lesser known stage in the middle between the two 
is a stage called swap and sort. And we thought that the best idea of how to explain to you and how to impart the knowledge as easy as possible on what MapReduce Paradigm is, is just walk through an example. And we're actually going to walk through a word count, which is the distributed computing hello world. And uh, we'll walk that through you right now. And we're going to start with the introduction to the problem. So as you can see here, we have a large data file on the left of what Dave, similar to what Dave showed you uh, before. But this is our ingest uh, into HDFS. You can see the cat set on the mat and the aardvark set on the blank was separated onto block one that exists on node one. Similarly, the mahout drove the was separated onto block two that sits on node two. And this is our distribution of our data storage-wise onto HDFS across the cluster. And so now we actually get to, let's start processing this data. Let's actually get into that block independence and process that data on that little bit we have. So what we actually have is a mapper class that is customizable by the programmer. And what that mapper class will be is it'll have an instantiation on each node of that cluster that is operating on that data. And so what the mapper class will do is it will iter iterate across every single record on each of those blocks that it needs to be processing on, and it'll It'll call the map method on each one of those blocks. And what a record is, default-wise, it's a single line of text in that file. However, it can be customized by the programmer. It can be block delimited. It can be white space delimited, so on and so forth. It's customizable. And so what the word count mapper will actually do is it'll go through each record and count the or read the word and it'll emit or write back to the file system the output of the occurrence of that word, which is one time, that time we're reading it. And so what does it actually look like? You can see here, we have each word that it read in that line and ones outputted for the occurrence. And we'll get back to that till later um, in the reduce stage. How do we actually co liquid those values together? And so you can see simultaneously, map was called on both nodes on each, the first record on each of those blocks. And then node one, you can see the second, the second record will be processed now. So now that we have these values separated here on the right, we're going to take these over to our swap and sort state is where we start to collocate those, those values together. And that brings us to our swap and sort stage. Here, you can see we have a local swap and sort, which actually finds similar key values locally on the node. Locally is the, the important part here. Locally on the node, it finds similar key values and then aggregates those values together um, for the value of that key. So you can have an example, you can have the word the on node one. It found four occurrences or four ones across that entire node, across separate calls of the map method. Similarly, on node two, we had two occurrences of the, and it, it, it outputted that as the same. Once we're done with the local swap insert, we actually have to go to the partitioning. And what the partitioning will do is it looks across the entire cluster and finds similar key values and aggregates those together into separate nodes that are going to be put to the reducer. And actually, as you can see here, for the word the, we now have the two values of the from node two, swap and sort, and then the four values of the from node one, swap and sort. And now we are perfectly ready for the reduce stage. And what that actually means is that we're going to take this data we just separated out from the map stage, and we're going to co-locate co it back together and get it actually to information that the user wants to see. And let's see how that works right now. The reducer for word count is just going to create a simple summation. So what it will actually do is look at the, the individual key values that we've put aggregated together during the swap and sort stage, and it will output a final sum for all those, all those values, iterating over the, every single value. So for example, on node 5, you can see the word the, and it has six ones concatenated together. Reducer 2 is going to concatenate how many ones there were, there were and output a 6, a similar number that the, the user can finally see. And that, in the simplest terms, is a MapReduce paradigm using word count. So what have we learned? First, we walked you through a little bit of storage, storing distributedly your file across an entire cluster, and what benefits that provides us. Parallelism, it provides us fault tolerance, it provides us replication in case a node fails. But also, we've learned how to process that data distributedly to also give us parallelism and throughput and all those things that we talked about earlier. The important thing to take away is when I was first learning MapReduce, I, it was really confusing. As Dave was touching on earlier, 
is a lot to take in in one slide. But the important thing is that you learn HDFS and MapReduce are simple ideas and technologies that you can use in the future to implement things and use technologies such as Spark. Spark is a technology that is also used in distributed computing, very, very similar to Hadoop. But the main difference is that MapReduce, instead of writing to a disk or file system after each subsequent stage, it's writing to memory. And that provides the quickness and the agility of Spark. But Spark in itself is also using HDFS. So these technologies and these techniques, learning them in Hadoop can also allow you to learn two new technologies and tackle that big data problem we were talking about earlier, the volume, the velocity, and the variety. And how do you gather all that data together and provide valuable information to your customer and valuable information to your, your user. That being said, are there any questions on Hadoop? Yes. 